There we go. Big crowd, hey? Yeah. Big crowd. Um, well, Robert, fantastic to have you here. Um, I'm sure everyone is looking forward to this conversation. For as long as I can remember, it feels to me that you've been on a global tour for the last 10 years, if not longer, calling on government, Western governments in particular to wake up to the reality that the world needs more copper, needs more critical minerals. Given that the US government and others seem to have finally woken up to that, do you feel like your work is done? Do you, can you sleep easy now? <laughs> baby steps for baby feet. Uh, almost nothing has been done to date. Uh, in America, we need a revolution in permitting to start. We're a country uh, with a gazillion tort lawyers. So no one has really built a, a tier one mine of any sort in the United States in, in a generation or two. So I think there's an incipient knowledge that we're beginning the era of the revenge of the miners and that there's really zero hope of achieving um, our current global warming goal of 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2050. That's a ludicrous. So you think that's, that's just, already, that's, already we've missed? We've already lost that. What about two, two degrees? India is talking 2070 to get to uh, carbon zero and China 2060. So the two biggest countries in the world are out of that goal. And the Western governments have even begun to get serious. We're burning more crude oil today, this afternoon, than at any time in human history. We spent $4 trillion on decarbonization. And we've reduced, uh, I think our energy is about 81% carbon intensive right now, down from 83, but the absolute quantum has gone up. So we've really made zero progress. So we have to get real about this. We need to build hundreds of nuclear power plants in the United States. The Chinese are starting to do it, but we're not even close. It's all just greenwashing. We're not even close. And you'll see as you get older, you'll see that we're not making any progress at all. That's real. I mean, that's just a fact. And, and until we get real about this, we're just fooling ourselves. All this nice stuff, all this, you know, it's all bullshit. This is all energy intensive. The microphone, the lights, the heat, the remodeled hotel in London. And we're rich. There's a billion people in the world that get their energy by burning wood. Their energy transition is to just get electrical energy so they have electric lights on at night. We've got to bring that billion people into a decent life. So if, so if we're making no progress, I mean, what, Ivanhoe's mining copper, what are you doing it for? Just in it, in it for the money? Oh, no. The, the situation is hopeless. It's not serious. Um, we're, we're showing the mining industry uh, how the whole thing has to be reinvented, and it's taken us 30 years. We, we're the glo we, we produce less global warming gas per unit of copper produced of any miner of significance up here on the stage. In order to do that, we had to follow the advice of our Martian overlords and go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where you have the richest supply of copper in the world. And we, we consciously designed a mine run with hydroelectric power. Because if we, if we go mining copper, we generate global warming gas in the process of mining that copper. We'll never get there from here. The world's largest copper mine, Escondida, has gone from about 1.7% copper to about point. Four or five of 1%. That's a two thirds reduction in grade in the last 15, 20 years. So you're tripling the amount of rock you have to grind down to talcum powder to get the same unit of copper. So global warming gas per unit of copper produced at the world's largest copper mine just goes up. You're desalinating seawater uh, from the ocean, which makes the oceans saltier, by the way. Desalinization of the oceans just makes the oceans saltier. Bad for the fish. And then you've got to pump that water up to 11,000 feet in Escondida. That takes a huge amount of energy, and a lot of the grid in Chile is coal. So this, we really don't have a realistic, feet on the ground appreciation for how big this challenge really is for our kids and our grandkids. And somebody really has to keep on, you know, there's that very attractive young Swedish girl. She's a little crazy. But, 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 there's so much lack of understanding of the supply chain and how big the, the challenge really is. We'll have this meeting every year. But today we're burning more oil and gas today than at any time in human history, right now. That's a fact. We're over 103, 103.8 million barrels per day. So look, I mean, take the Escondido example and the kind of comparison with Kamoa Kukula. I mean, you're not suggesting you should shut down Escondido because 
the kind of the purity of the grade's gone down and the kind of cost. It's not, it doesn't make sense to kind of shut down the existing mine to start out a new one, does it? Or do you think that is what should be happening? That's not our problem. We just told you that uh, we have to, you know, if my mine is 10 times the grade of your mine, I'm using one tenth of the steel, one tenth of the concrete, one tenth of the electrical energy, one tenth of the tailing spot, one tenth of the environmental impact. And so the most logical place to mine copper is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We all live on the same planet. We've got to go to where the metal is. Now, you want a permanent mine in the United States? I think BHP and Rio Tinto have been at resolution 25 years, and they're no closer to a permit than they were 25 years ago. We've got 10 trillion lawyers in the United States. We can't even decide who won the presidency. In the, in the next election, whoever lost is going to claim he won it. You know that, right? So, so in advanced democratic society, all we do is talk and argue, but we haven't really... Why do, we, why do the Americans just say, we're going to build 400 nuclear power plants, and let's go find the metal we need to build them, and really do something about global warming gas? Why not? You know, uh, the interstate highway system was built uh, by Eisenhower after World War II. All 50 states, you can drive in a, in a car all over America. You think you could permit that today? Think about it. You think you could permit the, inter the interstate highway system in the United States today? So the banana principle is so entrenched with fleets of lawyers, we really got to wake up. If you want to do something for your kids, your grandkids, we got to get serious. No more bullshit. Tell it like it really is. Two questions. Any, any sign that that is happening in the US, and then separately in Central Africa, so you say Congo is the best place in the world to mine for copper, is there more copper to be found in Congo than in the Central African So, population? you know, the uh, Inflation Creation Act, which I refer to as, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, it's about that thick. And, and it, it incentivizes making solar panels in the United States. Great. But the only American incumbent that makes those solar panels is dependent on a raw material that's mined only in China. So we underestimate the degree to which our international system is very delicately interbound. And as we balkanize the world economy into competing balkanized units, it's wildly inflationary. Uh, for example, you know, we tell Xi Jinping, uh, look, buddy, you can't buy any of our NVIDIA chips or any other kind of seven nanometer chips. He says, fine, I won't sell you the gallium and the germanium that you make those chips out of. So we got our, our guns in each other's heads. And it's devolving into war. It's very dangerous. We've got to slow that down. Because we now have the Democratic Party wants these metals to green the world economy because they're talking to a green constituency. And the Republicans, some of them, half of them, are worried about national security. And the other half want to give away Ukraine. And we, we thought that um, a war for the United States would be like going after Osama bin Laden. A bunch of guys, Navy SEAL Team 6, you know, night vision goggles. But now war looks like World War I, World War II, and we're out of 155 millimeter howitzer shells. It's going to take us 10 years to replace the howitzer shells that went off in Ukraine in the last 12 months. When's the last time this audience saw a civilian population being bombed back into the Stone Age to freeze in the dark? It's terrible. So where's this metal going to go? Is it going to go to the Army, Navy, Air Force? Or is it going to go to greening the world economy? Because you need the same metals for both. So we're creating for ourselves a real dangerous dilemma. What do you think 155 millimeter howitzer shells are made out of? Well, the, 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 the one that goes out of this, uh, the HIMARS, you know, they're called copperheads. They come out of the cannon. They reach their apogee. And then they, they sprout little wings, and they're guided by satellite. And then they land right between us with 40 centimeters of accuracy and take out this building. But they're very copper intensive. Do you think that copper is recycled in Ukraine? <laughs> and and uh, the financial world just is shorting paper copper, right? The, the, the International Copper Association comes up with a bullshit model. They're always wrong. And the copper price is actually down today with very low inventory when we need it for war and we need it for the, world, the greening of the world economy. Who's going to build a new copper mine at $3.5 a pound? We're just postponing you know, a disastrous situation. It's very easy to understand. This is not mystical. Nobody's building tier one mines that are green, except us, of course. And that took us 30 years, 30 years to build one. Let's talk about the scale. Um, we've mined 700 million tons of copper as a species since uh, ancient Babylonia. 
there's 150 million tons of copper in the American electrical grid just sitting there today. 150 million metric tons in the grid. If everybody bought a Tesla, if 10% of the population bought a Tesla and plugged it in at 5 p.m., the whole grid would go down, <laughs> be dead. The Texas grid nearly died in a little cold weather. The Chinese think it's 20 trillion US to upgrade the electrical grid in the United States just so everybody can have an electric car. It's not about the car, silly. It's how we generate electrical energy. It's how we transmit electrical energy. Never mind the microwave ovens and the electric toothbrushes and the washing machines. We have to electrify everything on this planet. So the miners should be canonized. It's our revenge period. But mining is the smallest percentage of valuation in the S&P 500 in living memory. We're down to under 1% of the S&P valuation. So why is Elon selling his shares and trading for Twitter? Because we're heading for a train wreck. These car makers aren't going to be able to get the metals they need to build the batteries. The whole supply chain belongs to China. So can I ask about exploration? If today you were 50 years younger, you were a young, thrusting explorer. Come on, no, 73 is the new 20. Where would you, where, 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 given what you've said about permitting in the US, where would you go? Where would you, where would you, where would you find the copper? There's a big shortage. I've heard you talk about that before. 10% of the, the, solution? 10 where do you the go? copper ever mined by our species was mined in the state of Arizona. So Arizona is dominant. And all of the copper was mined in mountains. So it's a basin and range province. The range is the mountain range. The basin is the valley bottoms. And uh, those porphyry coppers that produced one-tenth of all the copper ever mined. The great copper mines in Arizona are hiding under the valley bottoms under several hundred meters of gravel. If you look up at the Eiffel Tower, it's 323 meters tall. Take one or two Eiffel Towers deep of gravel. Under that gravel, there's another 30 or 40 giant copper mines hiding under that desert. And those are the ones we're allowed to mine, because if you go to mine a mountainside in Arizona, it looks like Sedona with a saguaro cactus. You're going to get sued. Nobody likes that idea. It's too pretty. But if you go underground, under a perfectly flat parking lot, you'll be allowed to mine there. So we have technology to see those mines directly. We inject gigawatt uh, bursts of electromagnetic energy into the Earth. The copper absorbs that electromagnetic energy and holds it like a battery longer than the unmineralized rock. We receive those signals and generate a three-dimensional image, and we can now drill for a confirmation. So it's like a CAT scan or MRI. Your dad or your grandma, they used to cut them open and look inside. Non-invasive scanning is far preferable. And that's what we do in mining now. We can survey the Earth. And so there are a series of disruptive technologies coming in train to make it potentially possible to find the metal we need for a, a human-scaled energy transition as opposed to a greenwashing nonsense. <coughs> but we need orders of magnitude more seriousness. So I'm happy that we have this Inflation Reduction Act. It's a baby steps for baby feet. But we're still burning more hydrocarbon as I walked in this door now than at any point in human history. Well, on that point about innovation, we have a session tomorrow, mine of the future. So in a world in which we hit, we say, you said 1.5 degrees is not possible. Say we manage to hit, to say under two degrees by 2050. What, 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 how will mines have had to change in the next, in the next 25 years to so get there? Like, what, so would, what would a mine look like? In the biggest problem in mining, it's a, it's a primal activity, is that if you take a rock that's this big and you want to make it half that big, it's, the energy required is x. And to make it a quarter as big, it's 4x. An eighth as big, it's 16x. So to grind rock down to talcum powder with compression is insanely energy intensive. Australia alone is using 14 gigawatts of power to crush and grind rock for the generalists in the audience. That's 14 nuclear power plants of energy is just crushing and grinding rock. So that aspect of human activity is generating, according to Bill Gates' group, about 6% of global warming gas. Steel is a little higher, the way we make steel, the way we make cement. But we have to change all these basic industrial processes. So we are working on a new way to crush and grind rock. We've been using compression. We bash rock together. We build big washing machines, and we tumble the rock with steel balls. If you're grinding rock, that's very, very, very energy intensive to get it down to talcum powder to liberate the metal. Fortunately, we have a better way to do it. We're going to use tensile force. We're going to pull the rock apart. 
And we can do that with about an 80% reduction in energy and liberate the metal. The French government has funded 50% of our R&D for 18 years now. And we, you know, we brought in Bill Gates, and we brought in uh, the European Economic Community, and we brought in BHP, which is the largest miner. And uh, we can do this. We can pull rock apart with tensile force. If you look at a, a concrete column in a building, concrete's very strong in compression. You can build a 100-story building on concrete in compression. But if we don't put rebar in concrete, that's those, with those little bumps, you can just pull concrete apart. So we're using tensile force. We're just pulling the rock apart and liberating the metal. And, and there are a number of other fundamental breakthroughs coming. Mining has been the last great industry to be disrupted. But the whole enterprise uh, has to be reinvented completely, or we have no hope of getting there from here. And you know, the supply chain, in World War II, the Germans invented these little needle U-boats to interrupt the supply chain between the United States and Great Britain. Great Britain was begging Roosevelt for help. And those, those ships you know, blew up uh, shiploads of iron or copper or nickel or oil. It was an interruption of the supply chain. Had we not had a person who figured out how to break the Enigma code, uh, Germany could have won World War II. That's how important supply chains are. And the West is starting 30 years behind any understanding of the supply chain. Even in the FT, most of you probably think a ham sandwich comes from a refrigerator. But I think doesn't. they come from Pret, actually. It comes from, <laughs> comes from 30 million pigs a month being slaughtered in a river of blood outside Chicago. I mean, the reality is ugly. The way we grow our food, the way we make our chemical fertilizer, everything needs to be disrupted completely. I mean, really, we need, it. We need to ground our kids in some fundamental understanding of how the world works. And so you know, I want to pitch this book, you know, How the World Really Works by Vruklev Smell. He's a mathematician. Until we get grounded in basic reality, we can't have an intelligent discussion about any of this. The rest is just greenwashing. Everyone knows you've got great connections in China. You've got a big Chinese investor in, in, in Ivanhoe. Are they, th are, they, are they thinking about it? Are they more advanced in their thinking? Do you think they appreciate the size of the problem? Or are they equally moving around in the dark like us? Well, you know, um, they're teaching their kids science and technology. Uh, they're ahead of us in many respects and behind us in others. The, the Chinese are like a giant uh, hive of bees and they give a little bit of royal jelly to one bee, they make a queen bee. And if you hit that hive with a stick, then every one of those bees is a suicide bomber. When a bee bites you, it dies. We don't understand the Chinese. They have a, a communal way of thinking, especially the party. Uh, and in America, everybody's free to have a gun and kill kids in, in the school. We just think differently. I mean, they look at our society, and when you read the Chinese press, they're predicting that America's going to collapse. And lately, it's fashionable to read in Western press about China collapsing, but they're going to have 5% GDP growth this year, guys. And they've been around for thousands of years. They're not stupid. So uh, I think both sides need to understand each other better. I'm very concerned about the way the situation is devolving because uh, we're intimately involved. Our, our economies are incredibly interwound. And uh, everybody wants to be a bigger China hawk than the next guy, but um, we have to be very, very careful here. I mean, do you kind of personally and commercially feel vulnerable to that, given Ivanhoe's, given Ivanhoe's um, investor no. register? No, when, when we first went to Africa, we sold a homeopathic dose of equity to the Chinese central government, the CIDIC, uh, because we thought in going into the Congo that um, since China was buying half the copper in the world, if any leader in the Congo created a real problem for us, the Chinese would take care of it. They're you know, protecting their supply chain. And the way the situation has evolved now, we're actually protecting our Chinese partners in the Congo. Uh, the, most Africans think that the virus was given them, to them by the Chinese in order to um, make them sick and steal all their natural resources. Uh, you know, the Americans are present in Africa only by their absence. The Chinese are everywhere. And so there's considerable anti-Chinese sentiment in Africa, and so we're protecting our Chinese partners because they help us with access to the supply chain. If you want to build a bridge or a port or a railroad, you go to China. If you want 30 years of litigation, you try to get an American company. We, Americans don't build stuff like that anymore. We figured out. We used to build nuclear power plants and 
railroads and ports, but that's all history. We, we flip hamburgers in America. They've got signs up in America now that says, uh, at McDonald's, you know, help wanted $30 an hour. Nobody's showing up. 15% of the population has long COVID. So we have a lot, you know, we got a lot of work to do here. I, you know, what we're talking about here is just the truth. It's so obvious. Let me see if any, we're going to wrap up soon. Let me see if there's any questions in the room because yeah, clearly, there be is, clearly nothing's off limits. Don't be so. shy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't be shy, you know, like, you know, I won't, we won't. Here we go. Let's, uh, let's take two questions here. Let's go with the gentleman with the pen and then the gentleman with the glasses. Hi, Robert. Uh, just your view on seabed mining. Oh, we hate the idea. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't touch it with a thousand mile long pole. Um, first of all, uh, sea life is, is, is dealing with all this plastic. There's just oceans of plastic. We've got to get rid of all this plastic. It's just terrible. And we just can't afford to take the risk. And we, the metals that are at the bottom of the sea that are so heavily tied, we don't even need those metals. So what you've got in these nodules, you've got some manganese and you've got some nickel. They're quite refractory. I had to get the metal out. And we don't need nickel to make batteries, and we don't need manganese to make batteries. There's a startup at, uh, out of MIT called Pure Lithium. You should Google it, Pure Lithium. Founded by Dr. Donald R. Sadaway, head of the Department of Materials Science at MIT, along with uh, Dr. Stan Whittingham, who got the Nobel Prize as co-inventor of the lithium-ion battery. And the battery of the future will be made with lithium metal, which will pull out of low-grade brines in one step. We won't make lithium carbonate or hydroxide anymore. We'll go directly lithium metal foil. There'll be layers of metal foil and copper. And once we have that on the cathode, or positive side of the battery, the anode can be anything. It can be made out of lithium, iron, uh, soft, copper, phosphate, iron, or better yet, some new valences of vanadium. But all this story that you need to mine the ocean to get nickel is bullshit. No, the next generation of batteries will not require nickel, it won't require cobalt. I'm long both of those metals. We will not need those metals. And therefore, thank God we don't need to touch the sea. We shouldn't even think about it. Let's take the last question from uh, the gentleman that has had a terrible idea to mine the ocean. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Robert. My name is Sean Lowry. I'm from ARCA. We're a climate tech company. We work with mine waste to sequester carbon dioxide. What advice would you give other mining companies to innovate faster? To, to do what faster? To innovate faster. Uh, well, in, in large capital-intensive industries, disruption never comes from the industry. But disruption does come. And so um, we're seeing a lot of interest in people out of Silicon Valley. I, you know, I, I got a call from Sequoia, for example, and, and they said, you know, we've had a lot of down rounds, and we're, we've been we've been listening to your TED talks or your or your. I've done a lot of podcasts, and they say they're quite interesting. We're beginning to wonder about the supply chain, and there's real huge interest in just trying to look at the mining industry from for, first principles. First of all, women have to run the industry because there's a hardware and a software component in mining. The hardware is just the machinery, the tons, the grade, the statistics. But the software is the relationship with the people around the mine. If you get that wrong, every iPhone is an NGO, click. And so the way we relate to people has to completely change. And we have to get women in charge. Our CEO is a woman. Uh, our, our women run the thing. And, and nobody uses manual labor anymore. It's not like we, in, in our copper mines in the Congo, nobody's lifting anything heavier than a pencil. We find that statistically the men grind the gears and damage the equipment much worse than the women that operate the equipment. So the software, the hardware, the way we relate to communities, uh, the way we deal with governments, everything has to be changed. And it, 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 I'm not, there is nothing easy about it, and it's not a business for intelligent people. If you're smart, you just write an app and sell it to Facebook when you're 19 and then retire. Mining is a miserable business, really difficult. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. You heard it here. Yeah. Mining is a miserable business. Miserable, absolutely <laughs> miserable. <laughs> we have a love-hate relationship with it, mainly hate. But, you know, it's a dirty business. Somebody has to do it. It's a primal activity. Um, everything you touch is the product of mining or agricultural development, one or the other. And the agricultural development is totally dependent on mining, the tractor, you know. And oil and gas, that's mining too, you know, it's just that. The, the, the expiration oil becomes a mine if you find oil, so it's, it's easier. 
Mining is far more difficult. This uh, conference um, in the city of London has to, it really needs to get very serious <coughs> about the scale of the problem. Uh, and you need people that actually go out in the world trying to mine, talking about how difficult it really is. It really does take 20, 30 years on average for industry to find a tier one mine. And you look at the numbers, they're so daunting. The task ahead of us for our poor kids or our grandkids, I've got a 12-year-old grandson. And I see how fast time changes. We are burning more hydrocarbon this afternoon than any moment in human history. And we can't pave the whole planet in solar cells. And the sun only shines four hours a day. That's not going to work. We can get there with geothermal power. The center of the Earth is a natural nuclear reactor. Most people don't know that. But Mother Earth is a nuclear reactor. There's so much remnant uh, uranium in the core of the Earth that at the center of the Earth, according to the best scientific models, the pressures create a natural fission reaction. Mother Earth is a nuclear reactor. That's where the heat comes from. When you go to the Mauna Lea volcano in Hawaii, you see all that lava? Where did the heat come from? So we think there's six billion years of heat under our feet. So geothermal can solve the problem because it's 24 hours a day. And nuclear power can solve the problem. But until we make a huge change, we're not going to get there with solar cells. That's bullshit. You have to pave the United States in solar cells. And then the energy density is too low. So you can do some, but not enough to solve the problem because the sun's only shining four hours a day. We need grid-scale storage. And you know the American electrical grid is like a little old lady, 115 years old, laying in bed waiting to die. That, that fire, you know, the Paradise Fire in California, you remember it? That power line was 106 years old. Just to give you an idea how old we are getting, the uh, bullet train in Japan is now 54 years old. And the 747 is in its 56th year. Like, we're, uh, like this, the future is now. Like, this time has already passed. And as a species, instead of doing anything material about potential anthropomorphic, global warming and creating a series of energy uh, transformations for everybody in Africa, for example. We're, we're cooking up old-fashioned war. We're working on it really hard as a species. And that's bad. And I don't know why we're not getting more information out to everybody on the planet about what's going on in Ukraine. How are they going to get through the winter? The Vladimir Putin cut oil yesterday. I think he's going to cut oil dramatically this winter and drive oil prices to the moon. That way, he kills Joe Biden and gets, gets uh, Mr. Trump back in the White House. And he'll kill uh, Rishi Sunak as, as roadkill on the side. $150 well, crude oil opening soon at a theater near you. You're laughing, but he can do it. He can just cut his export in half. There's a prediction. You know, $150 oil, no Joe Biden, no Rishi Sunak. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I'm not saying I want that, my dear. But I'm just reminding you what a dangerous world we live in and how serious we have to get in a real dialogue. Real. No bullshit. So, you know, we have a love-hate relationship with mining. Mining is changing. All of the majors are thinking in a new way. The dialogue is real, mm. you know. Uh, but we can't go out building these super low-grade copper mines at 12,000 feet. You know, these open pits are the size of London, grinding up all this rock to get less and less metal. Just can't do that. We can't get there from here that way. We have to... We have to mine high-grade deposits. Look, I'm not allowed to mine where it rains or snows more than it evaporates. If it rains or snows more than it evaporates, the tailings dam, the tailings have the consistency of jello. If there's any seismicity, the dam bursts. That's what happened to Volley and BHB. We had just had Volley up here. Did they mention their $46 billion class action lawsuit on the legacy tailings dam? That hurts. Hundreds of people died with that dam failure, yeah. right? So we, we can't mine where it rains or snows more than it evaporates because the new standard for the integrity of a tailings dam is in perpetuity. That's a long time. We're getting 100-year rainfall events yearly now. It's also a good advert for my panel tomorrow on tailings dams. They're a nightmare. So there we go. Tailings dams, they're a nightmare. <laughs> they have to be re-engineered. So I, I just I hope that at the end of the day we have a little wake-up call, a little cold water. The situation is hopeless. It's not serious. Human ingenuity is real. There's, there's real grounds for optimism. We'll be talking to the FT soon uh, about where we see grounds for optimism. There's a lot of very smart people in the world 
looking at the problem. And there's, there's hope. But it's going to be a lot like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom with all those big walls closing in and those balls coming around. It's going to be close. And we're not going to limit this to one and a half degrees. That's already gone. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. Robert. That's a wrap. Robert Freedom. Yeah.